<clears throat> Happy Sunday. It's good to see all your faces. I've been gone for, uh, well, I was gone last week uh, to a wedding for my nephew, and it is just good to be back with you guys and to see your lovely faces. So good. Um, got a couple things to walk through before we pray and start the message. Number one uh, is this passage right here from 1 Peter. All flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Amen. There's only one thing that stands forever, guys. Uh, there's a lot of bad teaching out there. There's a lot of people who want your attention. They want to influence you. There's a lot of, lot of people that are important today, but won't be important tomorrow. But the word of the Lord stands forever. And that's why we, we stop on a Sunday morning and we put all of our attention on God. What do you have to say to me from your eternal truth? Um, so that's what we're about to do. The second thing I want to show you is we got a QR code here. This is a new thing that we're rolling out. We've, we've had this kind of in beta for the last month or so, but here's what we're doing. If you would take out your phones and just point it at that QR code real quick, it will get you to sermon notes. Um, and so if you've got the Version Bible app um, loaded on your phone, uh, what this will do is it will take you to a certain page in the Version Bible app and all the slides that I'm about to walk you through, all the points, all the quotes, all the scriptures are all gonna be right there and there'll be a little note next to every single one of them where you can take your own individual notes for what was important to you. The really important thing is that right at the top, you're gonna see a button that says save. Please make sure you do that. Um, because what, what will happen is as you take these notes, you click save, it's going to keep an ongoing weekly archive for you so that you can come back to these in your life group, in discussions at home, at the kitchen table. Um, it, it's just going to be healthy for you. Now, I know some of you love your, uh, your note taking on paper. Continue to love it. Amen. It's okay. Um, you will not offend me if you don't use this, but if this is a help, I want you guys to have it. And I, I tell you what, uh, th thankful to, to Carly and her whole tech team. Um, they put this together every Sunday morning after I give my notes to them. It's extra work for them, but I think it's worth it. And I'm just glad that they've done it, especially today, because what we're about to dive into today is meaty. Um, this is almost a seminar that I'm about to give you today. Um, we're in Ephesians 5, which is where God has us progressing through the book of Ephesians. But today, Paul stops and starts talking to husbands and wives and gives them God's will for marriage. And when he does, it's, it's massive. He talks about submission. He talks about love. How you doing? You okay? It's so much that... I realized I had way too much information for just one marriage, or not one marriage. <laughs> Message. So we're gonna do the wives today, and we're gonna do husbands next week. So um, yeah, if I really tick you ladies off today, make sure you drag him back next week, and he will be just as ticked as you is how that's going to go. Um, let's pray. Oh, Lord, we need you. God, we need you. So, Lord, would you, would you keep me on the straight and narrow in this message? Would you keep me saying the right things, God? Would you, would you guide me, Lord? Would you shape the words, shape the teaching, God? This is, a, this is a congregation of people, Lord, online right now, in this room, and God, they need you in a special way. So, Lord, I pray that you would, you would be the one speaking, I pray that we would open our hearts, God, and not put our defenses up, but that we'd lower our walls and, and we would let you teach us what was the right way all along. And with this one today, Father, I just, I believe after a lot of study that there's been so much said wrong on this topic. And God, so many of us have let darkness come into our marriages because of that wrong teaching, that wrong understanding. And so Lord, I pray that you would be the one who comes and you correct all of those things. You set us on the right road, God. Give us your truth. And Lord, I, I pray that finally, when you've given us that truth, you'd help us to trust you because trusting you can be tough. 
We love you, Jesus. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Right to Ephesians 5, verse 18. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk us pretty quickly through the whole passage. And then I'm going to take us back. And we're going to take it a bit at a time, one phrase at a time, so that you can see where this really goes. I'll, I'll tell you this too, because you're going to see it here in just a second. There are about three verses in this passage given to the wives. There are about eight given to the husbands. Draw your own conclusions, right? <laughs> so next week, we've got a lot to cover next week. Um, also, you're going to notice as we go through today, I'm going to talk a bit slower. And I'm really going to take my time on this. This is a longer message, partly because as I dove into it, I think some of the mistakes of the past have to do that we've seen things kind of black and white where the Bible's version of it was pretty nuanced. And it takes time to look at nuance and to understand nuance. Some of you guys come to messages and you just want that tiny little phrase that you can take away and everything's summed up into this tiny little phrase. Today is not that. Today, it's gonna, it's gonna take some listening, okay? Verse 18, don't be drunk with wine. Because that will ruin your life, Paul says. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So he juxtaposes these two ideas. He says, you can be drunk with a substance which will be in control of you. Don't do that. Instead, be drunk with God. Be filled with God. Let God control you instead. That's the way to go. And if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, verse 19, you'll be singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, making music to the Lord in your hearts. And and there he says, if you're filled with God, worship is going to come out of you. And when worship comes out of you, it's not just going to come out of your mouth. It's going to come out of your heart because that's true worship. I know we're not to the marriage stuff yet, but this is where he starts. So he says, worship is going to come out. And then verse 20, and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because here comes gratitude and thanks is also going to come out of you. And then finally, in verse 21, further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So these three big things, if you're filled with God, worship and gratitude, and you're going to find yourself yielding your pride. You're going to find yourself submitting to other people in the church, in your community, in your family, submitting to each other situationally, depending on how the Lord leads you. Sometimes you win the decision and sometimes I win the decision. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Verse 22, for wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church, As the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleaning of God's word. And he did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. Do you see how Paul's describing what love means here? Love, me, love means sacrifice. And then verse 28, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church and we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery. How many of you feel like your marriage is a mystery today? A couple of us. But it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Well, that's a lot, isn't it? Oh, we're in it now, for sure. Some disclaimers. First off, Some of you have had pastors teach this passage to you and they've taught it in a very black and white, very tough, in your face kind of a way. 
Others have come to this passage for you and they have done some kind of Greek gymnastics and tried to explain the whole passage away as if it doesn't matter and as if it has no hold on your marriage. I think both of those extremes are wrong. What I'm going to do my best to do today is to tell you what this passage actually says. And as we walk through it, I'm going to try to show you my work. You ever lose points in math class because you didn't show your work? I'm going to try to show you my work because this thing has been all over the place for so long. I want you to see how I pulled some of these conclusions from the text. My goal is to not be conservative today or to be liberal with God's word with you today. I don't care about either of those extremes. I just want to tell you what the Bible says. And I'm going to try to land you where I believe the Bible lands us. So if, if I say something and you're taking notes and you're like, I, I don't know that I agree with that or I've heard about that before, the question you need to ask yourself is, did the pastor show it to me in the word? Okay. So here's the really scary slide. And we've only got one of these, but this is like seminary class for the next five minutes, okay? So hold on. I don't have a lot of this, but just, just hang in there for a second. So can we have this first slide with the Greek? Okay. This, this is one of the stu study tools that I have every single week as I'm studying a passage for you guys. This is what's called a Greek interlinear. And you don't have to remember any of that, but here's what's going on with it. Is across the top, you can see it's giving you the actual Greek letters and Greek words. You can see them, how they were written originally in the text. And then they come below it. And for every single one of those, they say, this is the literal meaning into English of that Greek word. And then it gives you that little number, which some of you guys remember the old Strong's Concordance. That's the Strong's Concordance reference number. And then it gives you, okay, here's what the phrase says. Here's why this is important. Because in verse 21, it was talking about communities and churches and families. And it says, you should all submit to each other. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ is what that says there. The word submitting is a word called hypotasso in the Greek. Say hypotasso for me. Hypotasso, congratulations. Hypotasso. Hypotasso means that you arrange yourself under. It's a military term. It means to take myself and to arrange myself under somebody or something else. It's about rank, but it's also voluntary setting myself into a rank, which is very, very important. But notice when you come down in tw into 22, do you see how it says wives submit to your own husbands? And the word submit there is in parentheses. Why? The reason is, is because the word submit in the second verse does not exist in your Greek New Testament. It wasn't there. What does that mean? Here's the thing. It is there. It's just in the verse above it. So Paul is essentially saying, you should all submit to each other and wives to your husbands. That's what he said. Now, why is that important for us? Does that mean submission goes away and I don't have to worry about it anymore my whole life? No. What it means is it is written in the context and very much attached to the previous phrase. And some of you have heard this kind of a message sermon given and they started at verse 22. And the first verse of the text that was read to you was wives submit to your husbands. Now let's talk about it. And that was a misreading of the text. Does that make sense? Yep. Um, even in some of your Bible translations, some of you guys are looking down right now and you're, you're checking out your own Bible translation and, and, and you might even see that there's a section break there where it's talking about the church up here and then it stops and starts talking about husbands and wives. And sometimes those translations put the section break between 21 and 22. That's wrong. The New Living Translation gets this one right. It, it doesn't always get it right, but it gets this particular one right. 21 and 22 have to go together. I know this is a lot mentally, but it's important. It's important for this reason, because when Paul said it, he said those things together. He said, submit to each other. 
And then wives, submit to your husbands. And when he did that, he made it not one-way submission every single time. Sometimes submission goes the other way. Are you seeing it? The other thing that he makes it by using the word hypotasso is he makes it voluntary, not mandatory. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to thread this needle here. This is really, really important. There's another word if you keep reading down through the passage. And the other word that you'll see is children obey your parents. Obey your parents is hypokuo. Can we have that slide? Let them see that. So hypotasso, submit, is, is that I voluntarily put myself under another person. I choose to. It's a gift that I give them by putting myself under them in that situation. Obey is very, very different. As you continue to read the passage, Paul uses this word hypokuo and says, children, obey your parents. Now, why is that different? It's different because children should always obey your parents. It's not two ways, it's one way submission. Does that make sense? It's one way and it is compelled. Every child should obey their parents all the time. But he stops and he uses a different word for husbands and wives. Now I'm walking slow here, but I'll say this. If you're in a marriage where the husband feels like his will needs to win every time, something's broken. And if you're in a marriage where the wife feels like her will needs to win every time, something's broken. Equal offense to all, right? It's submit to each other, hypotasso. Why would God do this, by the way? Why would God ask this of us? Why would he weave this into marriage? Of all the things, why would he weave this in? Possibly he wants us submitting to go after our greatest weakness as humans, our pride. We'll come back to that. Don't think about that too much. <laughs> Bible submission, biblical submission, the way the Bible talks about it that I just read to you. And again, you've got your notes. Go back and look for yourself. Chew this more slowly. Discuss it. Study it on your own. Bible submission should never be demanded, coerced, or manipulated. It is a gift. It is a free gift that you give. Now, here's a layout of the passage one more time that, that Paul's saying about marriage as he teaches marriage here. <clears throat> First off, he gives the overarching principle, be submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's the overarching thing. And then he comes to the wives. For wives, this means submit to your husbands. For husbands, this means love your wives, which we're gonna go into next week, the whole role of the husband. And then he ends with verse 32. This is a great mystery. Of course it is, Paul. But it is an illustration or parable of the way that Christ and the church are one. What he's indicating there is if you could figure this out, the two of you, and if you could do what God has called you to do, all of the sudden in the illustration, a picture emerges and it's a parable. Your marriage will start to preach to everyone who sees it. And it will preach first and foremost to the two of you. And then it will preach to your kids. And then the generations that come after you and then the world and the community around you. Your marriage could preach. So yeah, we do the wives part today. Submission is just like this nuclear bomb of a word, isn't it? God, you guys are quiet today. <laughs> it's, it's a tough one. Um, we're gonna drive right into it. Um, and I wanna acknowledge this. I wanna acknowledge who I'm, I'm kind of writing this sermon to today, this little seminar to today. Um, I wanna acknowledge that there are a lot of different groups of women and of wives in the room and online. And that matters because some of you have got a past where there has been trauma and there has been hurt by men in your life. And so this is a big deal. Um, it complicates it. And this discussion today 
might breed fear into you as you're sitting there. I just want you to know that you've been on my mind. Also, some of you, um, and, and I want to say this as sensitively as I can, but some of you have grown up embraced by this culture and you have swallowed wholesale what the culture says to you about how marriage and equality between a man and a woman are supposed to work. And you've so embraced that, that it has become poison for you when you come to a passage like this. Because a passage like this, on its surface, feels so offensive to you. And I wanna say that need for healing and that, that need to deal with that poison, I'm actually not gonna solve either of those problems today. I know they're there, but here's the thing, and this is part of what I had to face in my preparation, is if I truly tried to deal with both of those issues, I would never get to the beauty that Paul is trying to write about in the passage. I, I could tell you what it's not. I could tell you everything that's been broken, but I wouldn't end up telling you what the beauty actually is. And so what I've decided to do today is I'm gonna deep dive into what the beauty of this thing actually is. I'm gonna tell you. So the group of, of women that I'm speaking this message to and who I've written it for are those of you who long to know why the Holy Spirit penned these words in the first place. You're like, I don't wanna spend all the time, pastor, looking at everything that's bad. I wanna look at what's good. I wanna look at why God said this in the first place. I want somebody to teach me what the words mean. And if you've got that kind of courage today, I'm gonna treat you like somebody with courage and I'm gonna give you those words. Does that make sense? That is guiding me through this. So I've got some more tough topics to bring up as we dive in. So if you're the kind of person that needs to be emotionally prepared for tough topics, please prepare yourself right now because this is tough stuff. You ever hear the, the phrase, um, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater? Some of you heard it for the first time. You're like, well, that's dark. It is, I know. <laughs> but people used to say it. People still do. Um, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. The, the, the idea is you've got dirty bathwater, but you've got a baby. And in this situation, um, I would say there's a lot of dirty bathwater on this issue. And so I'm gonna bail some of that for you right now. Um, I'm gonna bail some of that for you to get us on the same page, to acknowledge what needs to be acknowledged in the church, because I think there's healing in that. I think there's understanding and there's empathy in that. But we are going to get to the baby, amen? We are going to get to that. So just hang on for just a second. So the Bailey and the bathwater slide. Here we go. Human history is full of women who have endured abuse. Sexual abuse, physical abuse, coercion, and manipulation from men who were politically powerful, powerful in the home, physically powerful, financially powerful. They, they exploited their wealth. They exploited whatever they had in order to subdue the women around them. And our history, our human history has got a whole lot of that brokenness and sin and darkness in it. It does. And I need to say that um, because some of those some of those men that did the abusing for some of you sitting here today, they are fathers or were fathers to you, husbands, even pastors in certain cases. We need to say it all because sometimes that stuff was done in the name of God as if this was the structure that was right and biblical. It, it wasn't, it was wrong. Sometimes that stuff too was denied for you or it was hidden for you or it was treated as, it, as if it was light and nothing. And it was not light and nothing. It mattered. So when I say there's woundedness in the room, there's woundedness, right? Some of our ladies grew up watching dysfunction between mom and dad in the home that they grew up in. And now they're in a marriage as an adult and their pendulum swinging to the other side, wanting to have nothing to do with what they saw growing up. And can I say, I get it. 
But here's the thing about pendulum swinging is you, you don't tend to find the truth in it because you're so focused on being away from what caused you pain. So there's a challenge in that. Some of you saw women treated like servants who must keep house, do all the cooking, do all the cleaning, bring the dinner at this time to the man while he sits on the couch like Homer Simpson. We'll get back to Homer later. <coughs> Dope. Dope. Um, or, or broken men individually holding women just back. And what I mean by that one is, is some of you guys have seen situations and maybe you're in a situation right now um, where, there's, where there's a man who is all about control. And this discussion of submission brings fear to you because you know this person in your life who has been all about control and they need control and you know that they need control. They can't be happy unless they know that they're controlling you. And that's a, that's a big dysfunction. But can I just say control is not love and control is a dark need to have in a human psyche. It's wrong. Um, and then you've got men who are are small. And I, I know it, it could sound like I'm men bashing right now. I'm, that's not the goal. We're going to get to next week and we're going to lift men up, by the way. Woo! We're going to lift men up and we're going to call them to be like Jesus. But the truth is some of you guys have got someone who lived with mom for way too long and they don't work and they're not holding down a job and they're addicted to porn and they're addicted to gaming and they're isolated, and their, their self-concept is low. And I could go on and on and on. And as I describe a person like that, maybe that kind of a person is in your life. And again, this idea of following what Paul is saying in Ephesians 5 is scary to you. I get it. It's bail the bathwater. It's a big deal. Here's the tough thing. Even if you're in a tough situation in your marriage, God doesn't give you an out on Ephesians 5. And even though he does not give you an out on Ephesians 5, I still think it's worth doing, bailing the bathwater, because we need to understand where you're coming from. And we need to stop and we need to grow in our empathy toward you, because for some of you, this is a much heavier lift than others. So let's talk about the baby. Why would God say this? What is God saying? What is this beautiful teaching that he's put in Ephesians 5? Why is it here? So let's dive into that. And first I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna talk about what it is, but I'm also gonna talk about what it's not. We're gonna define it very, very clearly. So the first thing is what it's not and I've got a list of what it's not. And this was provided to me by um, a pastor named John Piper wrote about this, gave six different things that submission is not um, because these are misconceptions and we need to understand the misconceptions. I'm, I'm going real systematically through this um, so that you can see it all in its own piece. Um, also, I did kind of abuse John Piper's list here and I added some of my own. So I'll leave it to you to guess which ones. Submission does not mean that you agree on everything. Number one, you don't agree on everything. If you agreed, it wouldn't be submission, right? If you were agreeing all the time, maybe you're just an agreeable person. Maybe you've got a people-pleasing issue. There's all kinds of things that could be there, but there will be moments where you truly don't agree and the scripture calls you to yield in the midst of. And you're going to see Jesus doing this later on, but it doesn't mean that you agreed. Next, submission does not mean leaving your brain at the altar. Please don't, ladies. We need your brains, amen? amen. We need your brains. We need you at full capacity. So if God made you intelligent with a higher IQ than your husband, glory to God. If he made you type A, if he made you a leader and an entrepreneur, if he made you creative, then all of those spiritual gifts and all those skills and abilities that God built you with, your husband needs them in your marriage. Amen. 
Because God's put a calling on your marriage that needs both of you. And it needs both of you functioning together, not one of you under somebody else's thumb. So don't check your brain at the door. Next, submission is not putting the will of the husband before the will of Christ. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped one. Where it's you don't try to influence your husband. Okay, submission does not mean that there's no discussion. Put it like that. There is discussion. There needs to be a discussion. So, so we disagree on a particular topic or a particular decision. There's a moment, there's a window where we're gonna have it out, where we're gonna explain all the things. We're gonna have court and we're gonna, we're gonna argue for both sides, yeah? Like all of that needs to be said. It all needs to be said out loud. You're actually gonna see Jesus argue his side of his case at Gethsemane. I'm gonna show you that later. So it doesn't mean that you just silently Go along, have your discussion. Next, we'll say, don't try to, or I'm sorry, putting the will of a husband before the will of Christ. You never, lead your, you never let your husband lead you into sin, is the point. So there is a line at which you don't submit ever. Um, this comes up in Acts chapter four. I'm not gonna put this up on the screen, but Acts chapter four, verse 19. The disciples are preaching Jesus in the, in the book of Acts and they come before the Sanhedrin, which is a Jewish ruling body, and they tell those guys to stop preaching about Jesus. They command them as their governing authorities. And in Romans, we're told to submit, by the way, to our governing authorities. Did you know that? Everybody submits all the time. And so the apostles at that point in Acts chapter four said, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything that we have seen and heard. So they're like, we will obey you guys as our authority up to this line and we won't sin for you. <laughs> Getting your spiritual strength from your husband. Your husband may be an authority in your marriage. That's what Ephesians 5 just said, but he is not your God. He is not your God. He is not your savior. He is not Jesus Christ. And we're just gonna keep going deeper and deeper into that idea. But that's important for you to understand because some of you have a, have a husband, spiritually speaking, who's in a very weak place and you can still be strong. Someday you're gonna stand before the throne of God, not the throne of your husband. Amen. Just make sure to keep that in mind. Next, living or acting in fear. There should never be a place for fear in your marriage. You should never be in fear of emotional abuse, physical abuse, coercion, manipulation. Fear should never be a part of it. And I'll just, I'll, I'll throw this blanket statement out there. If fear is a part of the experience for you, something's not, it's not just deeply wrong. It needs to be reported to somebody as soon as possible. Like you should meet with somebody. You should meet with family. You should meet with close friends. You should meet with a pastor, but you need to go after that. Fear should not be in the picture. And then finally, submission does not mean believing that your husband is superior in any way. That's not why the Bible said it. The Bible is not trying to propose the idea that your husband is the better leader, that he's wiser than you, that he's more spiritual than you, that he's got better ideas than you, that he's closer to Jesus than you. None of that is in the picture at all. Amen. And again, you're gonna see that in the example of Jesus as we, as we see him walk this out but please don't believe that. Hypotasso. So that's what it's not. That military term to place myself, to willingly, voluntarily place myself under someone else. That's what it's not. But here's what it is. We're going to get this from Jesus. I'm going to give you three big scenes in the life of Jesus because God the Son came down and took human form. Did you know that? And when he did, he walked in our shoes and he showed us the example of how to do everything. And especially he showed us this. And so really in your notes, what you should see from each of these um, scenes of Jesus's life is you should be able to pull, this is how submission operates. This is the, this is the positive. This is the, this is the actual teaching on how it's defined. First off, Jesus submitted to sinful human parents. You're going to see this in Luke 2.51. Now here's the scene. Jesus was 12 years old in this scene. Jesus 
went with his family to the temple and he got quote unquote lost. If you know the passage, he didn't get lost at all. He sensed God the Father telling him to go and teach some of the older men at the temple and have a, have a, uh, a discussion with them about the scriptures. And he was doing that. When his parents couldn't find him, they got kind of annoyed and came to him and said, Jesus, where were you? And do you remember his answer? He says, well, you kind of should have known I would have been listening to the father. And he kind of gets the discussion out there. He tells him the truth, but it's very clear that they want him to go and submit. So he does. He goes and he submits to them. Verse 51, and Jesus went down with them, that's Mary and Joseph, and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. That word submissive, hypotasso. He arranged himself under mom and dad. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. How many times did Mary and Joseph lose their temper in the home? How many times did they make a parenting decision that was selfish? And Jesus saw it. How many times did they make a call that was just plain wrong for the family and Jesus saw it? He was God in human form. He saw all of it. And so whenever they were being selfish, whenever sin was creeping in, he absolutely knew what was going down. Yet he still arranged himself underneath their leadership. Do you see him showing us the example? You even get this later on when when uh, he's at the wedding at Cana and he's 30 years old and it's right before his ministry begins and Mary comes up to him and says, they've run out of wine, son. I need you to fix this right now. Do you remember that scene? (laughs) And what does Jesus say? He, again, he follows the same pattern. He says, you're wrong, Mary. He said, it's not my time yet. And then he does it. (laughs) Jesus was always hypotassoing. Next, He submits to governing authorities. Jesus submitted to his imperfect government. Matthew 17, verse 24. This is when he's an adult and he has 12 disciples and he started his ministry here. It says, on their arrival in Capernaum, the collectors of the temple tax. So this group of people came and they're taxing the Jewish people for the temple to keep the temple going. And they came to Peter and they asked him, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Peter says, yes, he does. Then he went into the house, but before he had a chance to speak, Jesus asked him, what do you think, Peter? Do kings tax their own people or the people that they have conquered? Now, this isn't massively important, but I just want you to see it just, just quickly. Jesus questions this tax. Now, this is not a teaching that would say you shouldn't be paying your taxes. Can I just be clear? <laughs> I'm not trying to do that today. I don't think the Bible supports that at all. But in this situation, Jesus says this temple tax. Kings do a tax like this to people who are subject to them, not to the citizens and certainly not to the sons of the kingdom. And he says, right, Peter, what they're asking us isn't right. And Peter's gonna respond, verse 26, they tax the people they have conquered, Peter replied. Well then, Jesus said, the citizens are free. However, we don't want to offend them, so go down to the lake and throw in a line, open the mouth of the first fish you catch, and you will find a large silver coin. Take it and pay the tax for both of us. So Jesus says, they're wrong. And Peter, I want you to know that they're wrong. But we're gonna surrender to them. We're gonna yield to this moment because it honors God. Amen. And we're gonna trust him in this moment. And so we're gonna high potasso right now. And I love, I love that he asks Peter to submit along with him in that moment. And I love that as he asks Peter to do this difficult thing, he also provides, don't miss this, because Peter's heart was willing, Jesus provided the resource for both of them to do it. There might be a lesson there for us, maybe. Third scene, God the Father. Jesus' submission in the Garden of Gethsemane is not silent. It's not silent. So this is right before the cross 
And Jesus goes and he prays to God the Father. And he has known all along that God the Father's plan was that he go to the cross and that he die for all of humanity. He was their savior, was their rescuer. But he has this moment with the Father. Verse 39, Jesus went on a little further and bowed with his face to the ground praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. So what's he doing? He says, okay, you've asked me, but there's a space here where a conversation can happen. And that's healthy. And in the space of that conversation before the decision truly needed to be made, what does Jesus do? Like see in between the lines there, he's expressing his feelings. He's like, I'm not sure I agree with this. He's saying, I've got some feelings about this, Father. This is a cup of suffering. This is gonna be a whole heck of a lot of suffering, right? Like I know I'm not direct quoting him, but that's what he's saying there, right? He also even asks the Father for a plan B. I know this is your plan, but I'd like there to be a different plan. Gosh, sometimes in our marriages, we just need to say that out loud, don't we? I know, yeah. Submission is not silence. It's not. And Jesus illustrates that here. He still comes and he brings all of who he is to the moment. Why? Because submission isn't always one way. Sometimes, sometimes it needs to go the other way, guys. Sometimes it does. Now in his situation, obviously, you theologians in the room are like, yeah, but this is God the Father. That was all one way. And it was, for sure. But you know what I'm saying about the marriages. I'm gonna say a very challenging thing. Can we put the Homer pick up? There's a reason he is a caricature of an American husband. There's a reason for that. And guys, I'm not speaking this over you. I'm not laying all the baggage of that on top of you. That's not the point. The point is we can be better. The point is come back next week because we need to talk about, yeah, these are the three verses toward the wise, but we need to talk about the eight verses toward the men. Thank you. In one week, I know, I know. Um, here's what we need to acknowledge. There are no if statements in this passage in Ephesians. There's no dependencies that Paul puts in there. And sometimes it's been taught to you that way, but I, re- I think it's a really dangerous thing for you to accept. As Paul goes through and says, this is what a woman should do. This is what a wife should do. This is what a husband should do inside of this marriage. As he says that, he doesn't say wives submit if he loves. And he doesn't say husbands love if she submits. Those statements aren't in there. It's not dependent on the behavior of your spouse. It's important to, to face that because sometimes we let ourselves off the hook in, in a way that the Bible doesn't. I wanna say to you that sometimes people will say things too. They'll maybe share a testimony with you of, hey, ladies, um, I started to get into this better relationship with my husband. I started to walk in everything the Bible told me to do. And when I did, what I saw is that my husband started to rise. And my husband started to get better. And my husband started to grow. And that's a great story. And maybe that'll happen. But maybe not. I'm not gonna make false promises to you today because God doesn't put a guarantee in this passage either. Sometimes he does that in his goodness. Sometimes the husband does repent. Sometimes the husband sees the light and I love it when the husband sees the light, amen? Amen. 
But if I share that with you as if that's some kind of a guarantee, what will sneak into your heart is not a good thing. What will sneak into your heart is a desire to obey God so that you get this result. And that's gonna lead you down the wrong road. If you walk in the will of God, you have to do this between you and him. You know, the, the, the military phrase, you, you're, you salute the uniform, not the man. Is that it? Mm-hmm. Right? If you're gonna walk in this, you're gonna walk in this for the Lord, not for your husband. And are you loving? Is there a human element? Of course there is. But you've got to understand what's ultimate here. And it's very, very important to you because he's the only one that you can trust also in this picture. You can't trust the husband. You got to trust him, right? So God, why did you do this? Why did you call us to such a difficult thing? Um, Why did God... To the Holy Spirit, say, Paul, this is how to understand marriage and write this down in Ephesians 5. Why in the heck did you do it like this? Why did you give the different roles to the different people the way that you did? The short, honest answer is, I don't know. I don't know why he did that. I don't have a verse that tells me necessarily why he did it this way. But I have a guess. And sometimes my guesses are good. Sometimes not, but sometimes they are. But my guess is God understood the pride problem. And part of what he decided to build into marriage was to make marriage an engine that destroyed pride. Think about it. I, I, I've, I've shared the, the last several weeks. God has had us as a church talking about pride in sermons three different times this year. We keep going back to the issue of pride God, what the heck are you doing here? Why can't we get off onto a different topic, really? Why pride? And some of you guys are like, just keep going after pride because man, I'm feeling it. And I get it, me too. But pride's this massive thing. And and we've talked about the fact that that's how Satan started, right? With I will be like the most high. He started with pride. And then you go to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and and, and God looks at them, the first man and the first woman and says, there's only one tree that you can't eat. And what do they say? You're not the boss of me. That's how they respond. Of course, they've got to take that fruit anyway. And that's how Satan dangles it in front of them. Is he's like, you could be like the most high. You could be top dog. That's what he's saying. And as soon as he did that, the the central disease of all humanity comes into our very DNA, original sin. But what is it? It's that I have to be number one. It's pride. And if this is the central thing that's damaging us individually, doesn't it make sense that it's what's destroying our marriages? Doesn't it make sense that it's what's destroying our families too? And maybe God's smart enough to know that. And maybe... He's given us some instructions to reverse the curse in our own relationships. I mean, don't you see Jesus doing it? When Jesus comes in and he's like, I am going to be your example. I am going to trust the father. I am going to hypotasso myself underneath other people. And I'm going to show you all how it's done. That's what he did. All the way to Gethsemane. I think it's so interesting how Jesus did that. I think it's so interesting how when Jesus says, this is the way to be saved in Romans 10, 9 and 10, he said, you've got to believe, number one. But you can't believe like the demons do where they just acknowledge that this is the truth. The demons don't actually submit. He says, so you've got to believe Romans 10, 9 and 10. And then you've got to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And then you will be saved. And so right there in like for anybody to be saved and to come into the kingdom of God, one of the first things that they've got to do is they've got to hypotasso and say, you're Lord and I'm not because it reverses the curse. Do you see? And then he comes into our marriages and says, maybe this disease is doing the same exact thing in your marriage. So how do we heal it?
Sometimes someone's addicted to a substance like an alcohol. They say, I can quit any time. You ever hear anybody say that? I can quit any time. And let's be real. What you want to say in response is, really? If so, then quit and prove it. Don't prove it to me. Prove it to yourself. Yes. Right? Like that's the healthy thing. Prove it to yourself and actually quit. I wonder if it's the same thing with ego. You know, we say, oh, I'm really a humble person in my nature. I can really lay it down if I really have to. I can really submit if I need to. Oh yeah? Prove it. Prove it to yourself. Not to me, but prove it to yourself that you can lay this disease down in your life. Is God giving you the opportunity to do that? There's this passage in 1 John, and this is the last verse I'm gonna give you. We're almost done. Just look at the way that John puts this together. He says, if someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. You can't have one without the other. For if I don't love people who we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? Amen. So John comes into it and says, it's really easy to come to church on Sunday and say how much you love God. And then you don't actually love people. He's like, if you don't actually love people, you're fooling yourself about your love for God too. Because it's the person that's physically right next to you. They're the harder one to love because the rubber meets the road, doesn't it? It's the real test. Is it the same thing with pride? Is it the same thing with surrender? Here I am at church, God, and I'm singing the songs and I'm so surrendered to you, Jesus. I'm such a Jesus follower. I follow you wherever you take me. Is it possible that God's coming to you and saying, then I need you to hype a tasso with the person next to you? Because that's where the rubber hits the road. And that's where it gets really tough. And that's where you're really gonna feel it. Um, last couple things just to wrap us up. You don't have to agree with everything I said today. But I think what I'd leave you with is let the Bible confront you. Let it speak to you. Even if you disagree with my interpretation. You may not think that it says what I've said it says. But here's the thing, guys. It says something. So if you disagree with me, then what does it say? Paul wasn't wasting ink. Next, I would encourage you as a takeaway to talk to your spouse about submission. Talk to your spouse about this concept and especially, please hear me on this. If submission stirs fear in you and if submission has to do with fear for you, you need to tell him that. And you need to dive into that topic. And you need to find out why. And you need to educate him on that because he might be stepping all over your feelings and not know it. So get to a better place, the two of you. Third thing I would tell you is talk to mature women in the Lord about this issue. If you're at a spot right now at the end of this message and you're like, man, pastor, I wish you would have shared about 30 different uh, explanations or, or illustrations or, or practical examples of how um, this is supposed to work. And, and really what you're hoping for is you're hoping that one of those 30 is gonna hit your exact situation. And I get that. I'm telling you, you need to take a, a more mature woman out to coffee and you need to ask her for her examples. And you need to tell her the truth about what's going on in your situation. Because that detail and that depth, somebody needs to hear that from you. Last thing, drag your husband to church next week. Why don't you stand? Because there's some stuff that I did not cover today and you're feeling it. There's parts of this whole picture that makes it balanced and makes it all come together in the right way. And I didn't share all of it 
The second half is next week, so come for it. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for your ancient perspective on the human condition. Thank you for your ancient advice, God, and your life-giving wisdom, God, on marriage. God, would you bring us to a place, Lord, where we trust you? Lord, I want to pray for healing, God, for all that bath water that we talked about, God, and, and everybody in this room that's been dealing with that. Lord, I pray that life could come in where there's been death. I pray that light could come in where there's been darkness. Only you can do that, Jesus. Would you do that? In Christ's name, amen.